You're in the loop. We're here to discuss the ups, downs, and sideways of the sport of figure skating and maybe give you plus five GOE along the way. Let's introduce this week's hosts. Hi, I'm Neve, and I'm still recovering from the emotional trauma that was IDF. You can find me on Twitter at Riverdance. Hey, I'm Evie, and I'm glad for the return of Cup of China, just so I get a week where I don't need to wake up incredibly early or stay up extremely late for once. You can find me on Twitter at DoubleFlots. Hi there, I'm Kite, and I'm the only one on this episode without an interesting accent. You can find me on Twitter at MarkinZing. Alright guys, so we're already halfway through the Grand Prix. This is our second episode. Ooh, that's scary. Terrifying, the season is going too fast already, and we're going to be talking about the third and fourth competition, uh, Internationale de France in Grenoble, uh, and then uh, Cup of China in uh, surprisingly in Chongqing this year because it was it's I was just so used to seeing that one rink in Beijing that I just I was just surprised at how big the Cup of China arena was this year. <laughs> yeah, it was so big, especially compared to like the IDF rink, <laughs> which is kind of you know rinky dinky tiny with the you know hockey boards on one side. And then you've got this giant ass rink in China, which was mostly full for like yeah. a lot of the events. And yet, like they went all out with the crazy like theatrics. Like they had the floating lights. I thought IDF <laughs> spent all their budget on light shows until I saw Cop in China. <laughs> the fake fires at IDF. Excuse you, Neve. They weren't even fake fires. They were like fabric that like came up. They reminded me of wacky wobbly inflatable arm men outside of used car dealerships. That's what they reminded me of. I don't know if you could see it on the stream but we had like one right in front of us and once like I guess the cameras panned off the fake fire things they would just kind of like drip down slowly. Oh no. <laughs> they had the spark stuff like last year. Last year it burned the ice. When the fake fire things came out we were like oh they might have actual medals this year because Obviously, they spent the budget on the medals. But it's like, everyone was talking about how, like, you know, oh, Cup of China's always cursed, like, every single year, and how, like, oh, gee, like, Grand Prix Helsinki should just stay. But I'm like, I mean, it wasn't that cursed of an event. Yeah, replace IDF with Grand Prix Helsinki. Honestly, but, like, no one got food poisoning this year, so honestly, it's not that bad. (laughs) Cup of China was actually pretty... Not as cursed. It was chaotic. Yeah, but it wasn't cursed. So we're going to start off uh, talking about both of the competitions by going first into the pairs. So at IDF, uh, in first place, we had Anastasia Nishina and Alexander Galiamov of Russia. In second, we had Daria Pavlyuchenko and Denis Kodakin of Russia. And then in third, we had Haven Denny and Brandon Fraser of the U.S. And then at Cup of China, we had Sui Wenjing and Tong Han of China in first, uh, Peng Cheng and Jin Yang of China in second, and Lubav Ilusheshkina and Charlie Bilodeau of Canada in third. So there was some kind of interesting, like, fields at both of these competitions for, like, pretty different reasons. Because, like, we at IDF, we had pretty much, like, no clear standout winners from the get-go because, obviously, Vanessa James and Morgan Supre aren't competing on the Grand Prix this year. And then we also had Zabiako and Embert, who withdrew as well. And so... Like, the field was pretty, like, there are a couple of teams that could potentially get on the podium, but it wasn't really sure. We weren't really sure who was going to get up there. And then, like, a Cup of China, there was a much, like, <laughs> there were definitely some standouts. There was a much deeper field on, like, the top side of things. It was interesting, like, in comparison to look at these very two different events, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think the theme of IDF is that Russian pairs continue to be dominant, which is surprising to exactly nobody at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but I just thought, I mean, I just thought it was really interesting that the 2018 and 2019 Junior World Champions went 1-2 at IDF. Especially because we haven't really, like, seen them compete together, like, at all on the international level to get, like, it's very weird to see that kind of matchup with, like, oh yeah, the here are the Junior World Champions from 2018 versus the ones from 2019. Who will come out on top? This is my boxing match voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Russian ladies. Well, spoiler alert, so the, the 2019 Junior World Champions came out on top this time. This time, but, like, both of the teams were really, really strong, and actually, like, looking at both of them in comparison to what we saw last season... I can, like, see improvements in both teams, which is really, really good to see. I think, like, obviously Pavlyuchenko and Kodakin had a bit of an advantage going in just because they have been senior for longer and, like, you know, how they they made the final uh, 
last year as well. And so they kind of have that little bit of a edge going into the event especially with Machine and Galliamov when I was watching them I was surprised by the fact that like the one thing I had a problem with with their skating last season was the fact that their lifts while they were like like the positions that they had were really really cool and stuff they weren't covering as much ice and they weren't as fast as some of the other junior teams and so I really appreciate that like watching them here at IDF it seems that they've really been working on that in the off season like they've known they've realized that that is the thing that they need to you know, improve on when they're making that leap from junior to senior. And while they're still not, like, perfect, they there is a marked difference in their speed and ice coverage in those lifts. So I really appreciate that. Woohoo for improvement. We like this. Yeah, I do. I wish that they would work on their speed a little bit more because especially when, you know, they're skating up against a team like Pavlyuchenko and Kodakin, it's really obvious that they're not, you know, getting as much ice coverage as they probably should be. And it does come off as a little bit clunky on camera because they're skating to very dramatic music and the free skate and their movements are just like kind of a couple beats behind, you know, what the music is kind of portraying. I really wish that they would give Machina and Galliamov more like fun programs or just maybe something a little bit more modern because like the short program, like Je suis malade is so like kind of downbeat and serious and I don't think it really works for them as a team like especially like looking at their party like a Russian short program from like last season and the season before that it was fun it was upbeat like they were emoting and here it's just like yes we are depressed because we are sick you listen know? <laughs> however I will jam to anyone that does Jess we my lad <laughs> valid <laughs> no matter how good the program is well I think when like they already have you know some places to improve on with speed skating to something like just swim a lot just really highlights the fact that they're they don't get a lot of ice coverage they're not a very fast team and like at least on camera it came across as you know Pavlychenko and Kodakin having definitely the superior speed across the ice and their movements generally just being a lot more fluid and easy which I mean makes sense because they've been in seniors longer you know this is their second season like Evie said they've already made the Grand Prix final they kind of know like how to compete as seniors, or I think Mishina and Gailey Amoff are still kind of getting there, you know, just as a team and, like, growth-wise. And I think that, like, uh, Daria, her facial expression, like, the way she's emoting to the music, especially in the short program, has gotten a lot better in comparison to last season, because last season they kind of left me feeling a little bit cold in their interpretation of their programs. I still think the, f- the free for this season for them doesn't really lend itself to, like, that considering it's, you know, Tron, it's quite, you know, intense. Although I will keep laughing at the fact that they use, like, the really long, for long clip of the Jeff Bridges voiceover <laughs> from that movie in their free skate. I'm just like, I was watching it, and I was like, this is solidly nearly a minute of Jeff Bridges talking about the grid from Tron, and one, I love it, but two, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much voiceover in this program. There's so many voiceovers at IDF. And of course, a cup of China, you know, the main thing that everyone was kind of, you know, waiting for was the return of Sway and Han. Yeah, ah! Sway and Han are back. Yeah, so they didn't skate in any challengers or senior Bs earlier this season. Uh, they pulled out of Shanghai Trophy. They were supposed to be there. And then because I think Wenjing's ankle was still not feeling 100%, they decided not to risk it. And so this is their season debut, um, and they still came within less than a point of the world record in the short program, which was set by Tarasova and Morozov last season. And, I mean, the program, like, it's its first outing. It's not really in its top form yet. There's still, you know, some polish to be added to it, but that is a huge score, getting 80-plus in your, in your debut. They're here to show us that they are the class of the field. It's just as soon as you watch them at the start of, especially the short program, you can't take your eyes off them. It's just like, yes, look at us. We are the best pairs team in the field currently, and I wholeheartedly agree with them because, holy crap, this short program slaps. I love it so much. Especially because, like, James and Cipri are sick out for the majority of the season like although obviously like Sway and Han for me are the better team James and Sabri were one of their main competitors like last season so like now that they're sitting out it's like it's even more obvious that Sway and Han are like the top of the field yeah and especially since we've seen Tarasova and Morozov have problems both at Skate Canada and at US Classic it's just like Sway and Han you know they have the opportunity 
if they do well in their next assignment, obviously, and make it to the final. They've never won a Grand Prix final, a senior Grand Prix final before. That's so crazy to me. <laughs> yeah. I know, because they've been competing in seniors for so long and they've made it to the final so many times, but they've never won it. And I'm just like, this needs to change. This season is the season. <laughs> I mean, with some other top pairs sitting out this season, I don't think Soy and Han really have much competition, if any. To be honest, like none of the other teams can really match what they do technically and component-wise. They're, you know far and away the most well-rounded team in the world and I think if they can stay healthy this season they stand a very very good shot of going undefeated which would be huge for them going into like the pre-olympic season yeah especially because it's a home olympics for them but like I'm just so glad that they went back to like a jazzy kind of style for their short program because Blues for Kluke is one of my favorite programs of theirs and even though this one like isn't quite as good at least not yet I see a lot of potential there just especially Wen Jing's like expression and performance throughout that whole program how she's so playful in the way that she looks it just it's so great I love her so much and they're recycling their free from this from last season as well uh raining your black eyes which I was kind of a little bit hesitant about honestly like when I heard that they were going to recycle because you know worlds was just such a moment for them but here, the interpretation to me felt a lot more like joyous and happy. I think it just might have been like a home, like skating in front of such a big, receptive, warm home crowd that it made them, you know, go the extra mile with like the happiness meter was turned all the way up. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. Something about it felt more natural to me. Yeah, I mean, I it makes sense to me, I guess, because it is such like a beautifully choreographed program. Like it really is just a piece of art and they only got to show it twice last season. I'm not really sure I would even count four continents as, like, I mean, obviously they competed there, but it was literally their first time, like, really running through it, like, all the way through. So, you know, they only got to, I guess, show it once in when they were both really in a condition to be, like, skating it to their full potential. So I'm really excited to see them, like, kind of give this program the time that it deserves on the world stage. Because it is so beautiful and, like, it's iconic, but I think that's not going to detract from, you know, what they do with it this season. Another, like, standout team for me at Cup of China was the North Korean pair, Teo Kyum and Jusik Kim, because they're one of my favorite teams, and I was really excited to see them on the Grand Prix. But I am so upset because they ditched their Malaganya short program that they did at Neville Horn, and I loved that program. I was so excited to see a tango from them, and then they ditched it, and I was just like... <sighs> I was so disappointed because the IDF website had listed them as James and Seabury's replacements. So I think it must have been just a mistake with them being at Cup of China this week. But I was so disappointed when they were like took off the website. I was like, I want to see them. I'm just happy that they've got new programs, honestly. Like that's the the one thing I wanted from them, considering they've been they've recycled this that short program at Free Skate for like three seasons. I'm just like, yes. You know what? If it works, it works. <laughs> if, if it works, it works. But there's something to be said for like three seasons, the exact same short program, the exact same free skate i got very kind of bored of it <laughs> by the end of last season i love them but and those programs are pretty great but i was just like i have seen this too many times and now they've got new ones and i think probably their free skate is the best program like that they've ever had period it builds so nicely especially towards the end when the music becomes a lot more like triumphant and you know they've already landed the big elements they can just you know focus solely on performing to the music and it's just it works so well for them although it looked like Jusik injured his arm after the free hit like he was holding his shoulder as he was going off the ice I'm really hoping he didn't like strain himself or anything because he looked like he was in some pain <laughs> But also, they're doing a throw triple lutz now. When did that happen? I don't know because they were do they weren't doing that last season, to my knowledge. They were doing like throw cells and loops. I don't think they were doing any, uh, like toe jumps in throws. But like, go them, I guess. Get that base value. Exactly. <laughs> We've mentioned this before, but another standout is Danny and Fraser's free, which is great, and I accept no criticism of it. And it's honestly, I think, my favorite free skate of the season. Like, any discipline. <laughs> oh, for any discipline? Oh, Go. okay. Them wow. spiking words. To be fair, though, it is only, like, the fourth event of the season, so, like... I was about to say. <laughs> I thought you would have gone straight for Jason. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay. He's close, but... <laughs> I mean, I think, I think of, like, 
all of the U.S. pair matchups that could have happened this season, I definitely did not see Denny and Frazier being the U.S. pairs who, like, were walking away from the Grand Prix with two medals. I was expecting Kane and LeDuc. Yeah, I was expecting them to, like, come out and try challenge to be one of the top. Yeah, and we saw, like, they won U.S. Classic over uh, Peng and Jin and, Ter- and Teresa Vara Morozov uh, in September with really quite high scores for them. So, yeah, going in, I was definitely like, yeah, out of all the U.S. pairs, they're probably going to be the ones that are going to be the standouts, but no. I mean, I'm here I'm here for it. Looking forward to the Grand Prix final, uh, we have Pavlyuchenko and Kodikin who have uh, qualified with their two silver medals uh, here at uh, IDF and one from Skate America. Uh, Peng and Jin are in with a gold and a silver. Woohoo. Uh, it, it looks like uh, Denny and Frazier, they've got their two bronze medals. They're likely to be on the alternates list, but, you know, who knows? People could mess up of the next two assignments and things could get thrown out the window. Stranger things have definitely happened. Looking forward to who is still able to qualify. So at Rostelecom next week, we have Tarasva and Morozov and Boykova and Kozlovsky for the big names. Um... Tarasov and Morozov need a silver better because they have a bronze from Skate Canada to um, get into the final. And then Boykova and Kolovsky just need fourth or better. It's definitely doable. <laughs> yeah, I think a clean Tarasov and Morozov should be Boykova and Kozlovsky just, you know, in terms of polish and kind of PCS. But they've kind of been concerning this season at their, you know, previous two events. So I'm not sure that's going to happen. I'm hoping that the, because they had a pretty big gap in between Skate Canada and, you know, their second assignment, I'm hoping that little bit of a break will help them just, you know, get in the right mindset to come into Ross Telecom with like a fighting spirit and try, you know, hopefully put out some better performances than what we've seen. And then uh, coming up at NHK, we have Swain Han's second assignment, uh, as well as Machina Galimov. And we also have uh, more towers Marinaro. Uh, you know, Swain Hart are probably going to get to the final, you know, hopefully knock on wood. Uh, <laughs> they're probably the standout of the field to get gold at NHK. Uh, and Machina and Galimov definitely have a chance uh, if they get uh, silver or bronze. If they just get on the podium, they'll probably make it to the final two. Uh, and more towers Marinaro, they need to do better than what whatever Tarasova and Morosov get at Ross Telecom in order to win that tiebreaker for points, which could still potentially happen if they win a bronze at NHK. And like if Tarasova and Morosov don't do as well as they would hope uh, in Russia, it's totally possible. Oh boy, <laughs> just thinking about the final and how close it's getting is just making me anxious. I can't believe we have two, like people have already qualified. Well, we are four events in, so. Yeah, that's horrifying to me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, should we go on to the men? Yes, let's go. The boys. So our podiums uh, at IDF in gold, we have Nathan Chen of the US. In silver, we have Alexander Samarin of Russia. Uh, and in bronze, we have Kevin Amos of France. Uh, and then at Cup of China, in gold, we have Boyang Jin of China. In second, we have Han Yan, also of China. Uh, and in third, we have Matteo Rizzo of Italy. So, let's talk about the ice at IDF. Because it needs to be said, it was bad. It was awful. I mean, I Neve was there in person, so she can definitely get give you, like, you know, a first-person, like, view of it. But even on camera, there were literal puddles on the ice that you can see in some of the replays. Like, you know, skaters would put their hand down during a jump and it came out, like, dripping wet. And so... I mean, in addition to seriously messing with your jumps and spins because you're already losing, you know, what very little friction you have from skating on solid ice, it's actually really, really dangerous if you land a jump in a puddle because your blades are going to go right out from under you and you have no control of your movements and you're already moving super, super fast. And it was just like a recipe for disaster. And I'm honestly, like, surprised that we didn't see more, like, concerning incidents from, you know, the skaters really struggling to, like, perform their elements when the ice quality was just such a disaster and like you know i think nathan after the short program because he kind of had the mistake on the triple axle um you could see him kind of saying something to raf and the kiss and cry and he was pointing towards the patch where he had messed up the axle and another general theme of this event was axles kind of being mia because you can't do edge jumps when the ice is literally water and your edge can't grip onto solid ice to get you into the air for the jump and it's it was just really frustrating. Yeah. Nathan was having problems with his axle and then like Shoma was also having problems. So many people were having issues with their edge jumps 
And you look at it and you go, like, this is clearly because the ice is not up to par. And it's just at this point, at an event this big, it's kind of unacceptable to have, like, this lower ice quality. I think it didn't come across as much on camera as it did, like, even as a spectator. Because, like, I haven't went back and watched a stream fully because I'm still very emotionally scarred. (laughs) But, like, being there on the ice, you could literally see the water splash when someone landed a jump. Like, that shouldn't happen. Like, when someone lands their jump, you expect to see some snow. But you, you're you not supposed to see liquid water. It's like, this is advanced snow. I was like, to the ones beside me, I was like, we might as well be watching synchronized swimming. <laughs> <laughs> Polar ice cap, synchronized swimming, coming to an Olympics <laughs> near you. <laughs> as if it couldn't get worse. Like, the FF... SG tried to deny the ice quality on Twitter. Yeah, they were like, oh, it's just like, you know, reflections from the lights. I'm like, yeah, the reflections are really just on this, like, one patch of the rink and nowhere else. That makes sense. But, like, even, like, as a spectator view, like, temperature-wise, it was as if they just couldn't decide on what temperature they wanted. Like, one program would be really, really, really cold as if they were trying to freeze the ice a bit. And then 10 minutes later, it would be really, really warm and you'd be sitting there in just a t-shirt. Yeah, and then we had Cup for China, which, you know, we all kind of expected to be extremely chaotic considering the field here. And its history. And its history. (laughs) Its reputation really does precede it. It really does. And like how well, we had so many like men competing here in kind of like the middle of the field all with like similar scoring potential or like similar inconsistency. And because like there was no one clear winner like we had the last couple of weeks because like Vincent Joe, he withdrew from both of his assignments. Uh, and so, yeah, it was kind of like who was going to step up. And then everyone kind of died a little bit. It was very messy. A summary of the Cup of China short program is Han Yan won despite having not competed in nearly two years. And without a quad. So let's go on kind of a sad note I guess to talking about Shoma Uno who did not have a good outing uh, at IDF. That's putting it lightly. It was one of the most like heartbreaking like performances to watch like it was up there with Boyang at Worlds 2018 levels of uncomfortableness for the free I mean I wouldn't even say it was it was probably worse than that because at least Boyang at 2018 Worlds like he was coming off of a fourth place finish at the Olympics he was probably just really burned out at that point yeah that's and true. he was like at least you know he kind of just got up and brushed it off and he was like sometimes it happens whereas like you could see Shoma was really like he wanted to have a good outing he wanted to like show that you know, he's been able to, he can keep up with, like, the top ranks of men, even during this transitional period, and it was, it was really rough. And especially after having such a tr- a tough free skate, the fact that he had to go sit in the kiss and cry by himself, I was in tears at the end of both of his programs. It was, yeah. <laughs> and I know that the crowd was really supportive towards him, especially your section, Neve, the area you guys were sitting in. Thank you, thank you. The Shoma yes. support corner. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, based on what he said after the competition, I think the transformation of his mental state has been really amazing because in the past he's been pretty open about the fact that he struggles with, like, self-doubt and with not really believing in himself. And I think for the first time at IDF, you know, granted, after he had two really, really rough programs, he realized for the first time how many people are behind him and are supporting him, you know, no matter what his results are. He said something in an interview where after a skate like this, I would have said sorry, but I just want to say thank you. And then after the gala, I think it was, or before the gala, he said that for the first time in a while, he felt like he wanted to compete. Yeah, like watching, you know, skating live, not just, you know, someone who has a rough skate, but, you know, watching a skater kind of go out onto the ice alone, it really, like, puts it into perspective how lonely it is to be out there and... You know, being able to come back with the knowledge that, you know, you aren't alone and you have people behind you and supporting you, you know, no matter what is is something that I think every skater needs if they want to really rise to the top of the rank. I'm really glad that he's going to go and train with Stefan for like these next couple of weeks leading up to Ross Telecom because I think that being in that kind of, you know, supportive environment, getting some feedback from a coach will really help him going into Cup of Russia. Rostelecom at this point isn't even about him going out and winning because he doesn't need the points so that makes sense like he's out of the Grand Prix final no matter what. 
So, like, it's not as if he has to go into Ross Telecom with, like, the mindset, oh, I need to win, I need those 15 points. It's like he just has to go in the Ross Telecom and put together two performances that he can, like, be proud of. Well, going on to a bit more of a happier note, let's talk about Kevin! Kevin! Yay! His first major medal and on home ice. He is so wonderful. He's a natural, he's such a natural performer. Like, you know, I think in the last episode people were talking about some skaters, you know, the music turns on and you can just see that they feel with their body what they're supposed to do, you know, in rhythm to the music. And I think Kevin is honestly probably like the peak example of that in skating right now. His style is so different and so modern. There's no one else, at least in like the top maybe 30 elite skater men that has the same style. He's very, very unique in that regard. Yeah, I hope that a Grand Prix medal is the stepping stone that he needs to finally get the scores he should be getting from the outset, especially in components, because as we all know, components are, you know, heavily reputation-based. I think it'll be really exciting to see how his performance and scores develop from having a really good skid at Autumn Classic and then getting a Grand Prix medal and seeing how that goes into Europe, especially with Europeans. Yeah, because there's definitely a, like, potential for Europeans to be, you know, up for grabs. But, like, honestly, when he started crying after both of his programs, I immediately started crying as well. Even though it was, like, happy tears, I was just like, oh, Kevin, oh, boy. But honestly... His short program, The Question of You short program, it's my favourite of the season so far. He had my favourite short program of last season as well because I loved Horns. He's keeping up that streak. It is the best. I really hope he has a good showing uh, at NHK because he really does have a chance to get if he gets on the podium, you know, he has a chance to get to the final, which is amazing. I have so much stress about NHK. Yeah, NHK is going to be a thing. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Let's talk about another uh, home crowd medal. Another first Grand Prix, well, for this first Grand Prix win for Boyang Jin. Yay! Woo-hoo! Especially with his, like, history in the Grand Prix. Yeah, he doesn't usually peak on the Grand Prix. He peaks... You know, sometime around like four continents and worlds, which like if you got to pick a time to peak, that's probably the better time. But it, yeah, it was always kind of concerning to see that he was a little bit stagnant in the first half of the season and he wasn't really, you know, getting in front of the judges and making a strong case for himself to be, you know, a top three man. And then he finally just went out and, you know, what didn't have perfect programs, but he did more than enough to secure the win. His quad Lutz is God tier. It's the best in the world as usual. There's nothing more I can really say about it other than the fact that if you want to train a quad lutz, just go and watch Boyong Jin's. The deep outside edge he gets on it and then like the extremely clean toe picking. Obviously he gets close to the boards when he lands it, which is always terrifying, but it's just, it's so nice. That's kind of Boyang's thing at this point. The one thing I would like to see him improve on, just it's kind of a small nitpick. is just his landings are still a little bit scratchy. He lands a little bit forward. And so he doesn't really have the cleanest running edge coming out of it, but like as far as takeoff and speed and air position go, like God tier should be in a textbook. Boy on Jin, go give jump clinics. <laughs> <laughs> and like his free skate was almost clean if it wasn't for the fall right at the end of the program when he literally fell in the ending position. Oh my god! <laughs> and it wasn't even it wasn't even on an element. That's why I always get so like worried when I see skaters like their their ending position is like on the ice or like they're not you know fully balanced like last year Rika in her free skate she had that like where she was on one knee at the end of her free skate and like sometimes during the run through you could see she was like really struggling to keep her balance and I was super super stressed about it all the time and then boy I actually went out there and proved to me why I should be stressed about skaters who decide to end their program like that (laughs) I'm torn about his free skate I think I don't really feel like he's connecting to the music in the first half he still seems to be skating over it rather than skating to it. But then as soon as the tempo kind of quickens halfway through, he seems to hit his stride and really starts emoting. And I think some of the issues of projection that he has have to do with him focusing on landing his jumps. And he's not really paying attention to the choreo. And so I'd like to see him kind of integrate jumps and interpretation more smoothly going forward. I think that also like the music in the first half it's kind of doesn't have a lot of build. It really picks up pace in the second half when obviously he's done all of his jumps. He can focus on, you know, emoting, like throwing everything into the last couple of choreographic and step sequence elements. But I think the music doesn't really lend itself to like expression and, and interpretation, at least for him. 
and yeah, I'm just, I'm not a huge fan of this free skate. I really, really like his short program. I think it's one of the best he's ever had. Uh, you can just see how much he's improved in his performance skills in that short program. It's just so nice because, you know, he constantly gets nitpicked about his components being the weakest, like, of the top men. And I'm just like, look, he's actively, like, making these strides. Like, while he might not be improving in some areas, like his transitions, because he's still, you know, they don't give him a lot of transitions into his elements, especially the quadlats. But you look, he's making an effort to, you know, make sure he can express the meanings of the programs in a much more open way than we've seen in previous seasons. I mean, he's made such huge strides in just the past season with, like, paying attention to his upper body, especially his arms. Because I remember his arm used to be really stiff during, you know, the choreographic elements of his programs. And it was really just not, it was, like, jarring to see because it seemed like it just... You know, he didn't really seem to have a lot of upper body awareness in the past. And with the free skate, I finally started to see that he was, like, understanding how to integrate his full body movements into expressing the music. And also with, you know, just kind of his mental state and putting early mistakes out of his mind, like popping the quad toe and then, you know, having a clean skate the rest of the way through, which is not something that you would have expected from Boyang Jin, like, last season. Yeah. <laughs> say like you know he would have an early mistake and then the whole program would kind of just fall to pieces but it seems like he's really been working on that which is really 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 relieving to see and I think you know Grand Prix final may be out of the question for him depending on how the last two events go you never know (laughs) but this yeah this gives me a lot of hope if he looks this good in November I have I have hope for his progress later in the season. Okay, shall we talk about the return of the one, the only, Mr. Han Yang? Yes! <laughs> I'm so happy. So for newer fans who maybe joined after the Olympics and don't know the saga of Han Yan, he was consistently one of China's top two men for the last Olympic cycle. You know, he was seventh in the Sochi Olympics, um, but unfortunately he dealt with some injuries and a general lack of support from the Chinese Federation. That made his competitive journey really, really difficult. And so he struggled at the 2018 Olympics where he was 23rd and for a time just sat out of the sport and was really trying to reevaluate what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. And he was gone for 20 months. So he hasn't competed since the Olympics, which is in February 2018. And he made his comeback at Cup of China and won the short program. I legitimately forgot how good his like basic skating skills were until I saw him. It's been so long since I watched a program of his that as soon as I saw him in the short program and the way he just effortlessly glides across the rink, he needs like two crossovers and he's got enough speed to cross the entire like length of the rink. It's insane. And you just look at him and you go, he's so smooth and so nice to watch. It's just like, yes, this is what good skating is. Like, Thank you. <laughs> and I feel like bringing back the Twilight short program was a good decision because he done it the Olympic season. He only has the one assignment, which is Cup of China. He would actually be in a good spot to qualify for the final if he had another assignment, which is really hilarious to me and honestly speaks to how chaotic men is this season. Like, of all the men who potentially could be on the cusp of making it to the final, Han Yan was probably not on my <laughs> short list of men. I know, right? <laughs> We're back in 2015. We have Han Yan and Nam Win. <laughs> we really have we've time warped someone get him to nhk if they can i don't know how they're gonna do it but i just i need him to have a second assignment i need it there was a moment after the short program when we were like wait if he wins this entire event and he has no second assignment like what happens (laughs) a couple of uh shout outs we have uh nicholas nado from canada who honestly I have become such a fan of him over the last couple of competitions. I don't know what the hell happened, especially his Depeche Mode free. It's so much fun. I love him. So I saw him at Skate Canada and he like landed all of his jumps in the free skate. And then he was so excited that he landed all of his jumps that he tripped and just belly flopped and like (laughs) penguin slid across the (laughs) ice right in front of me. So I'm glad that that was not like something that happened another shout out is tomoki hiwatashi from going from 10th in the short at idf to fifth overall after the free that is my son i'm so happy for him i've always like liked his skating but it was just during like the practice sessions of idf and i was like oh he's so charismatic and our last little shout out is to brendan carey for having like the most uncle programs of the season despite not being an uncle especially his short program it's the biggest freaking trip it's just you really have to just go watch it it's 
crazy. Let's briefly look forward to the final. So Nathan is now in with two golds, Skate America and IDF. And then it's like shoulder shrug as Stephen Wells. <laughs> like, obviously, you know, Yuzuru Hanyu has his second assignment at NHK, but I don't trust his second assignment anymore. And I just, I don't want to jinx anything. Honestly, I don't want to like make any predictions about what's going to happen at NHK. Listen, if he just comes out of the event with two ankles, I'll be happy. I'm going to be really happy. I, I, I know he's going to do his best. You know, he should have no problem winning NHK in, in the field that he's in. But I just, you know, historically I have, I have some trauma s- surrounding this. And the other men seem to be kind of be going like in a mass extinction event. <laughs> At this point, Boyang, who has 20 points, might make it, depending on, like, what the next two competitions. It's just... It's, like, comparing to what we were saying at the beginning of the season of, like, oh, who's likely to make the final? It was, like, Shoma, Vincent, Boyang, Keegan. And now it's just everyone... Well... Everyone's just being knocked well... off one by one. <laughs> now it's just we're putting up a darts board with skaters' faces and just throwing darts. And it's like, okay, you can make the final. <laughs> we're spinning the wheel, boys! <laughs> There's like eight men who can qualify still at this point, and it's just like, you know, at Rust Telecom next week, there's Alexander Samarin, Dimitri Liev, and Nam Nguyen. So Samarin needs to get on the podium. He already has a silver from IDF, and then Dimitri Liev was third at Skate America, so he needs a silver medal or better. Nam needs to get on the podium, and he can potentially bump Dima off the podium, depending on how they both do. Neither of them are the most consistent skater. So it's like, it could be both of them, it could be neither of them, who knows. And then of course, Shoma is also going to be at Rust Telecom, and he's a potential spoiler. If he can skate well, he can potentially block one of the aforementioned men from qualifying for Grand Prix Final. So, yeah, a lot is up in the air. And then at NHK, you have Yuzuru, Kevin Amos, and Jason Brown. Like I said, I refuse to jinx Yuzuru by putting anything out into the universe, except that I know he's going to do his best. <laughs> Kevin needs a silver medal or better, and then Jason needs to get on the podium, and neither of them are the strongest technical skaters, so it's just going to come down to who's better on that day. And then uh, Sota Yamamoto is also a potential spoiler at NHK. He's been having a pretty solid season. Honestly, I'm still so pissed that he didn't get a second assignment. If he can skate a clean program, he does have more technical content than Kevin and Jason. And if those two make mistakes, he can potentially spoil their chances of getting into the Grand Prix Final. Uh, that's a big if, but this whole season is kind of a big if. So, you know, what else is new? Honestly, I would love that just for the fact that Sota and Yuzu are on the same podium together. Oh, that would be so much, so much good content. Yeah, the men's Grand Prix Final, it's like such a motley crew of skaters potentially vying for the bronze medal. You know, assuming, you know, Nathan's already in, Yuzuru. Assuming all goes well. All goes well, <laughs> and he, you know, makes it to his December competitions this year. You know, Shoma and June didn't make it to the final this year. Vincent and Mikhail are sitting out the Grand Prix, and it's really, you know, thrown a wrench into the standings. And this is a great season for a middle-of-the-pack skater to break out and make a case for becoming a top man. <laughs> not not naming any names, Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to Ice Dance. So for the podium at IDF in first, unsurprisingly, it's Gabriella Papadakis and Guillaume Cizeron of France. In second, we have Madison Schock and Evan Bates of the US. And in third, we have Charlene Guinard and Marco Fabri of Italy. Uh, at Cup of China, in first, we have Victoria Sinitsina and Nikita Katsalapov of Russia. In second, again, we have Madison Chong and Evan Bates of the US. Uh, and in third, we have Laurence fournier Baudry and Nikolai Sorensen of Canada. Woo. So, unsurprisingly, Papa Dux and Cicerone got another world record here at IDF in the Rhythm Dance. We're back to, you know, skaters, I stance team specifically, not hitting their levels and then just getting super high GOE and negating the fact that, you know, they didn't actually hit all of the key points or whatever. I mean, at this point, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of Stockholm syndromed into this. I'm like not at all bothered by their scoring anymore. And also it's the early season. I'm not expecting people to hit their levels this early, especially because, you know, last early season with Tango Romantica, no one hitting their levels whatsoever. This season's actually slightly better on that front. Finstep is a little bit more forgiving. They were definitely the class of the field they deserve to win i just don't know if i'd be giving them close to 90 in the short program where they're getting like level twos and threes on their steps oh yeah yeah no i completely agree (laughs) i feel like for me it's just kind of like because they're in a field of their own i just kind of see them being first and i'm like okay that's fine 
Like, I just pay very little attention to their actual protocols. I'm like, you know what? It's fine. Yeah, honestly, I'm like, there are there are other things that I can get mad about. This is not a thing I should be bothering to worry about at this point. <laughs> I'll just stick in my cor- into my little corner and focus on the fact that the Italians are still getting robbed. Like, it was a thing last season. It's a thing this season. They are such good skaters. And honestly, I would have put them in second over Chalk and Bates in both the Rhythm and the Free. Like, their skating skills are just in a like miles ahead of them and they literally skated a clean free dance at the beginning of the season (laughs) what kind of i can't this is just they are the first team this season to skate all level four in the free and it's at their first grand prix and it's just blowing my mind yeah i mean the italians are the best technical skaters in the world and it's really not even close at this point and i think they're objectively much better ice dancers than chalk and baits and all of the technical, you know, respects. And then in all of the components, except for maybe interpretation and performance. Yeah, I agree with that. I saw them at Grand Prix final last season and they're just so powerful and they get such great ice coverage and they obviously drill their technical elements to make sure that they're hitting, you know, all of the key points. And I just, I feel like chalk and baits getting kind of question mark scores is the theme of, of the past two events, honestly. Honestly, I, they won the free dance at Cup of China by a four point margin over Sinitsina and Katsalapov. And like, honestly, I don't like either of those teams free dances this season. They're both, they both have problems. Like obviously Sinitsa and Katsalapov, their free dance this season is quite similar to the one they had last season. You know, it's that soft floaty classical, which in my opinion does not work for them <laughs> at all. Yeah. They need something like edgy or modern, like kind of what they did for their tango last season, which really worked to them this kind of you know floaty program and the fact that they have two kind of you know more classical style programs with singing in the rain and now this it's just like (sighs) guys i I, you have really great elements and like basics but i just can't like you because i don't like your programs and then obviously chuck and bates's whole egyptian snake free dance which i don't even want to talk about it's that bad we don't want to get into that see our cultural appropriation episode for more on that that'll be coming out in a very short amount of time in like a week so but i it's the same thing i said you know regarding the italians that they should really be winning easily against a team like chalk and baits with superior components and all but maybe interpretation and performance like chalk and baits are great performers they're fantastic performers maddie serves so much face and their their main strength really is connecting to the music and the crowd but they shouldn't be winning segments with you know their technical elements or if they are winning not by four points yeah four point is a huge margin in ice dance to be winning a free dance by especially when they had a lower base value than sk did in the free by like it was like a point but that's still you know quite a bit and there was quite a big point gap between both those teams in the rhythm dance because chalk and baits didn't hit their levels and even though they didn't hit the levels they still got really really generous goe i think they only got a level one on the fin step but they still got like plus two or something Whereas, like, teams that were hitting, like, better levels than them were getting, like, maybe a plus one or, like, even less than that. And I'm just like, okay, okay, I see how it is. <laughs> the US Fed is putting all their eggs in Chalk Bates' basket. I get that. My whole thing is how it's interesting to see Chalk and Bates scoring go up against Hubble and Donahue's. Especially because, you know, this is, Chalk and Bates' uh, free dance score here at Cup of China is the highest free dance score we've seen, like, outside of Papadakis and Cicerón. It's like how Papadakis and Cicerón just aren't even factored into this anymore it's like aside <laughs> from them yeah it's just like we 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 understand they're gonna be at the top let's worry about the rest of the field but like especially when thinking about the free dance how hubble and donahue have lost the free dance twice in a row at skate america and skate canada now chalk and baits are posting these really really high scores here in the free it's making me extremely nervous for nationals let's get into talking about papadakis and cicerone a little bit more deeply because this is their first uh like major competition of the season we saw them at uh french masters but we uh obviously this is they didn't do any challenges so this is the first time we're seeing both their programs in competition and uh, honestly i think this is probably the first time i've actually liked a rhythm or short dance from them their fame is actually quite fun and i appreciate that they've gone for a more like upbeat kind of theme this season yeah so my take on the on the rhythm dance is if you're gonna skate to music where they're counting above the pattern 
you had better be right on the beat. Yep. <laughs> because they, they were slightly off and it just kind of threw the whole thing for me where I'm like, am I supposed to be paying attention to the counting? Am I supposed to be paying attention to like the steps? It's a good idea in the theory, but if you're not going to be pulling it off into practice, what's kind of the point, I guess? Yeah, it's just like it creates a disconnect for people who are watching. But like, I think honestly, I would be completely sold on this rhythm dance if it weren't for the lift at the end of the program because they've just kind of recycled that same like version of the stationary lift they've been doing for the last couple seasons and I don't think it works for this kind of program because look they're in spandex they're all like athletic and stuff do a crazy you know acrobatic style lift I think that kind of like lift would work a lot better especially I don't think a stationary lift in particular works for this kind of program I think you know something a bit more dynamic that travels across the rink that highlights the music would work a lot better for this rhythm dance but like overall it's really fun I really want to see it in time I guess <laughs> I mean I think this rhythm dance you know with more run-throughs and more polish definitely has the potential to be kind of one of those iconic programs like Jason's River Dance that can really like bridge the gap between figure skating fans and people who aren't necessarily fans or know much about it so I'm excited to see where it goes I yeah like Evie said I just want them to actually be on the beat and then their free dance is a little bit out of the box <laughs> this season it uses uh like poetry spoken word poetry by the artist Forrest Black in it it's pretty it's a very interesting concept and we haven't really seen this kind of program before like obviously we've had like plenty too many voiceover programs but like none with like all voiceovers <laughs> before. It's like Papa Douglas and Scissor and watched the rest of IDF and was like, you give us voiceovers, but we're going to give you voiceovers. You call those voiceovers? <laughs> this is a voiceover. You know, in the past, it's like, I think Papa Douglas and Scissor have been criticized a fair bit for not really branching out of a certain style that they've used to, you know, really rock it to the top of the standings. And this is so different from what any of the other teams are doing and what they've done in the past. And I really commend them for taking this risk. And they're probably the best team to be taking this risk, honestly, because they're pretty much untouchable in the ranks and have a lot of room to experiment with like different music choices. But yeah, it would be easy for, you know, a team who's so consistently at the top to just kind of fall back on the reliable music choices that have helped them get there. But if they're really, you know, it seems like they're really trying to actually, like, develop their expression and their range more. And not just their expression, like, they're actively, like, developing their elements as well. Like, the lifts that they're doing in this program are a lot more, like, challenging acrobatic than we've seen in their past couple of free dances, which, you know, as a person who loves acrobatic lifts, is really, really nice to see. And especially, I love the double Ina Bowers they do into that one, that lift, like oh halfway through the program. It's so yeah. nice. Oh, it's so stunning. It's a really great transitional element and the way that they kind of bend and flow with each other, it just works so well. I'm almost sold on this program. It's just, this just, and this might just be a me thing or a watching over a stream thing, but watching it, I was really more focused on listening to the poetry rather than actually watching their skating. I found it quite difficult to focus. And I just, yeah, I, this obviously there is something to be said about watching I Stance through a stream and how it does come across a lot more like strongly in person. But yeah, Neve, I w kind of want to hear your input on that because obviously you were there and you saw the program. <laughs> I just like remember the arena being like quiet. Like it was just one of those programs that like, I don't even remember, like, I had to rewatch the program to actually tell you what happened in the program, if that makes sense. But like you said, it, ice dance is definitely one of those disciplines you have to be there in person. But, like, this program especially is one of those ones you have to be there in person because just kind of the connection between, like, the voiceovers and the instrumental and then their actual skating... It's just not the same on person, especially because Papadakis and Scissorin, I don't even think their, like, core skating skills come off as good on the stream. Like, they're so fast. They're just watching them in practices and, like, the warm-up. You'll blink for, like, a minute. Not You don't blink for a minute, but, like... <laughs> I think that's called sleeping. <laughs> Casual comas at the rink! <laughs> You'll blink for, like, a second, and they'll just be the complete upper side of the rink. And you're like, what? Like, even just re-watching it, like, I get goosebumps, but, like, watching it in person was just a 
out-of-body experience. It really, yeah, I really did feel like kind of like a religious ritual almost if that makes sense like I personally didn't think the voiceovers were that distracting because I thought it was like a good blend of the spoken word poetry during the more choreographic moments of the program and then the background instrumental when they were doing the technical elements so I didn't feel like the elements themselves were really overshadowed by the words but yeah the silence and the rank and the kind of like ethereal piano music almost made it feel like I was like in church (laughs) It's definitely one of those programs that, like, if you see it on paper, like, just seeing the word spoken word on paper, or, like, hearing it firsthand, but, like, when you see it done, and you see it as well done as theirs is, and you see it by a team that is so polished as they are, it just, like, there's no words to describe it. Let's go on to talking about our bronze medalist, Queen Art of Fabry. Honestly, I'm so happy that they went with, like, a modern style free dance this season, Because especially with, like, the fact that it's more modern, the fact that it's kind of sharper and more dramatic, which, you know, we talked about this last season in relation to the tango rhythm dance, but, like, Charlene especially, her facial expressions really lend themselves well to, like, more dark and, you know, dramatic programs, and I think that really works, and I I really like just the choice of music as well, because, you know, Space Oddity is one of my favourite songs of all time, and I love Amanda Palmer, so a cover by her of that song is just, like, match made in heaven for me, and it's, yeah, it's just so good. Their speed and their ice coverage and just how effortless everything looks, especially considering that Marco had a hand injury, here at IDF, I was really worried, like, during the lifts and stuff that he was going to drop her because I was like, is his hand, like, weight-bearing? <laughs> is it okay? Like, I've always been, like, fond of them because, as anyone who knows me knows, I'm a massive River Dance and Lord of the Dance fan. You don't say. What? I didn't know that, name. <laughs> <laughs> and they have, like, one of the best, like, River Dances or, like, they, like, combine River Dance and Lord of the Dance. And I've said this before, but if you haven't seen it, go watch it. <laughs> so, like, I've been fond of them from that. And then last year at Helsinki, they played Claire de Lune instead of their rhythm dance music. So, like, there's just always been, like, little instances of them that have just made me, like, really fond of them over the years. It's, like, recently just seeing everyone, like, get on their team and everyone, like, really get behind them has been really nice. And I'm like, oh, please, rise. I'm so upset about their assignments, like, this season because, like, They've gotten, like, two of the toughest assignments, like, for a top team in the circuit. They're up against Papa Ducks and Scissor in both times because they're both going to be at NHK. And then they also have, like, an NHK they have Stepan and Buchan to go up against. And so most likely they're going to walk away with another bronze, which, you know, two bronzes is going to put them probably at first alternate position for the final yeah it's not an automatic qualifier no it makes me so upset (laughs) i want to see them at the final especially because you know the finals in italy this year i want them i want to see them have a home crowd grand prix final and it's like we don't want to wish bad on anyone else but like no (laughs) (laughs) so time for me to rant about my kids go off evie let me talk about wang liu I can't even express all my feelings like about this team as a whole just and all of the feelings about like their improvements this season not just like in their base technical ability but also just in the way that they've been scored because they've had a massive jump from last season to this season and like it started at Nebelhorn and we saw it at Finlandia and now we saw it at Cup of China like their, their personal best their rhythm dance score their personal best last year was 69 nice nice uh, <laughs> uh and in the last three competitions they've been like in the mid 70s which is insane yeah, especially a nice dance especially a nice dance to see that kind of jump that quickly like over the course of one off season and then like in the free as well they had like low 100s all throughout last season and then they hit 110 here at cup of china and just like Finally, the Gadbois bonus is working for, like, Asian Federation teams. And, like, all their GOE was really, really good. And I was just like, is this a dream? This is everything I've wanted for them. Oh, my God. And just the fact that they got so much, like, home crowd support. Like, they easily had the most applause out of anyone in the ice dance field here. And they got so many plushies. Oh, and they got invited to the gala as well, which is really great because we didn't get to see them at any galas last season. 
But specifically, I just, out of both their programs, I really wanted to talk about their rhythm dance because it's Charlie Chaplin. And as soon as I heard it was Chaplin, I was just like, this is, I'm not going to like this. Why? I don't like most Chaplin programs. Like the only one off the top of my head that I really like is like Anna and Luca's show program that they do. You know, the one where Luca's like in the crowd sleeping, that one, that's fun. I don't like any other chaplains. Like, no, thank you. And then as soon as I saw this one at the Chinese, like, test event last uh, last month, I was like, oh, my God. Not only is this, like, the best rhythm dance that they've ever had, this is probably, like, my favorite rhythm dance of the season, bar none, because I think I was talking with Kat about this, I think, but, like, this program could be very boring if they weren't 100% committed to performing the characters and, like, they don't break character for the entirety of it. You d- never see them drop that kind of goofy expression. It's just, like, it's amazing. And also it's like, Shin Yu, you said you didn't like funny or silly programs. So you were wrong. You were perfect for them. You have the best face to pull off a derpy program. <laughs> I just love that they look like penguins. They do. I love the fact that they've got the matching costumes and they've got like the matching choreography in, in places. It's so good. The matching costumes as well just really like elevate the height difference. He is a tall boy. He is. She's not short. I mean, she's like tiny, but she's not like short, but he's just really, really tall. I'm so happy that they got a fourth place finish, which is just insane. I never would have guessed that they would get that good a result here at a Grand Prix. Yeah, they were pretty close to the podium, actually. Like, unfortunately, yeah. I think it was like one level in the in the free dance that kind of dropped Yeah, because Shin Yu, he messed up his twizzle in the free. And, you know, that level plus, you know, the GOE would have gone from that. It probably wouldn't have made up that gap. It would have been very, very close, but just because they had a like a little bit of a difference between the Canadians and them in the rhythm dance. So just work on your levels, guys, <laughs> you know. But just I'm just so happy for them. This is everything I've wanted. Right, shall we look forward to the final? If we must. <laughs> All right, so Hubble and Donahue are in with a gold and a silver, and then Chalk and Bates just qualified after Cup of China with two silvers. And then the skaters who are still able to qualify at Ross Telecom next week, we have Sinetsina and Katsalapov up against Gillis and Poirier. Gillis and Poirier actually have a higher season's best in the free. So they're actually on pretty, like, even ground. On the other hand, it's in Russia, so I don't have a lot of hope for Gillis and Poirier winning outright unless Snitsin and Katsalapov really mess up because they are Russia number one right now. Yeah, and I mean, they just need to get on the podium here and they'll go to the final and, you know, that's going to be the first time they're ever going to make the final. So yay! yay! That's what we like to see. And then... At NHK, in two weeks, we're going to have Papadox and Cicerone, who are given to probably take the event by storm, and then Stepanova and Buchan should round out the 16s going to the Grand Prix final. Yeah, Guinan and Fabry probably aren't going to qualify unless they somehow manage to get silver over Stepanova and Buchan, which, you know, isn't out of the realm of possibility. It's happened before. It happened at Grand Prix final last year, but uh, is slim chances. And then we've got the Canadanes, who have the two bronzes. Uh, they're also on the bubble, and they're probably going to end up being, you know, second alternates behind Guinard and Fabry, probably. Jesus, this Grand Prix final is going to be hell. <laughs> it's going to be such a bloodbath, and I'm, like, totally here for it, because there have been some pretty major upsets this season, and then some previously dominant teams are starting to look a little more vulnerable. And I think silver and bronze of the Grand Prix final are basically up for grabs at this point to whoever can put out the cleanest programs. It's probably going to come down to the wire for like those like silver and bronze spots. It's going to be very intense. But like, I honestly, I didn't appreciate how kind of like calm last season's Grand Prix final was because, you know, Papadakis and Cicerone and Chuck Bates both coming back this season has really thrown a wrench in the works overall. And now it's just like, I have all of these teams that I really want to get into the final. But now there are two others that have come back and I'm like, no, I can't. They're no longer a given anymore. (laughs) Why is it like this? (laughs) Oh boy. It's, yeah, dance at Grand Prix Final. It's going to be hell. Grand Prix Final, full stop. Full stop. Okay, last but not least, let us go on to the ladies. We have at IDF, we have Aliona Kostrnaya in from Russia in gold. We have Alina Zagitova in second, also from Russia. And we have Mariah Bell from the USA in bronze. And with Cup of China, we have Anna Sherbakova in gold from Russia. Satoko Miyahara from Japan in silver. And Elizaveta Tuktamasheva 
from Russia, also in bronze. Let's talk about how strict the, like, calling at both of these events were. Because, like, the tech panel was, what like... Bruh. Oh, boy. The tech panel was awake? <laughs> Question mark? <laughs> yeah, they, like, emerged from their slumber. Being, like, in the arena, because we don't have the access to live calling and levels the same way that, like, viewers do back home with the TS box and stuff. Every time, like, a score came up, we were like, what? I remember, I think it was Wagaba's short program and we were like the entire arena was just kind of like wait why is it so, what yeah i mean it's kind of sad that we're just so complacent for like the fact that the tech panel is not gonna basically do its job and we're all just like surprised when like people actually get called on stuff it's sad <laughs> i mean i think the skaters were quite surprised too like alina zagitova got edge calls on her LUTs and under rotations on her triple-triple combos, and she has never been called in her LUT edge in seniors before. Yeah, that was shocking. Yeah, and then for, like, in Aliona, she got called on the triple axle in the short, which I don't know if I agree with personally, because the landing was a little bit wonky, she was a little outside the circle, and it looked like, you know, she was kind of doing that fish hook thing where you don't really quite get your under rotations. Yeah, the camera angle wasn't really the best to gauge it. I probably would have given it to her, but if they were being really strict. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to have a problem with the fact that though, like they called it because, you know, they were being pretty consistent with their strict calling, except when, like, in the case of Mariah, who didn't get very many calls in both programs here. Yeah, that is that was so weird to me that she was the only lady in the short program who didn't get called on either edges or under rotations and it's like really egregious because her triple triple combos are visibly under rotated yeah we, like it's known that she has like issues with under rotations it's not you know it's something that she's been having issues with like throughout her entire senior career and it's like yeah shocking that especially because in like the replays you could visibly see that she was you know hooking around to finish off the rotations on especially her combos like you said kite it was just very visible and yet she didn't get called. And also, like, just looking at her scoring here, it's interesting to, like, compare her scoring to Brady's, what we saw at Skate America and Skate Canada, because they're definitely, like, closing ranks, and it's just, it's definitely much more close between them now than it has ever been. So I guess nationals will be interesting in that respect to see them go up against each other. Yeah, which doesn't, honestly, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like, Brady has similar issues where she kind of tends to under-rotate the back end of her combos. Like, she's one of those skaters who, you know, really has expressive, like, facial expressions and her upper body movement is really excellent because it's concealing the fact that she's not really doing much with her feet so the fact that she like was outscoring like calorie and components is really really confusing and further demonstrates that i don't think anyone really knows how to score components at this point and they're kind of just like throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks like the scoring like the calling here at idf was really really quite strict and then we also had quite strict calling at Cup of China as well. You know, two events back to back with, you know, a pretty strict technical panel, which is really impressive. I mean, Anna, all of Anna's Lutzes were given the unclear edge call. Like, they weren't given an actual wrong edge call, but all of them were given, you know, the exclamation point, the warning. And then this isn't really out of the ordinary, but Satoko got quite a lot of under rotation calls. And the only ones who got off call free were Amber in the short and then Lisa in the free. And like Anna got called, but she still got like a healthy like 152 in the free and one overall. Like even with the strict calling, she was still able to get that kind of score. So there you go, I guess. Shall we go talk about Eliona Kostanaya? Honestly, made me cry. About a minute and a half into it, because I was so nervous for her, right? Because, like, the ice was really bad at IDF, as we all know at this point. And also, like, she had some pretty rough practices there. It seemed like, you know, there were a lot of reports that she would get off the ice and she'd be, like, crying. And, you know, Danielle would be trying to console her. And she was really just struggling with, like, her triple axle and everything. And then, you know, adding that to the ice conditions, I was just kind of a nervous wreck. Like, all of last weekend. When are you not a nervous wreck when Eliona competes? <laughs> this is fair. True, 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 true. <laughs> but yeah, she, you know, like, minute and a half into her free program, I just started crying. And then, you know, she's just such a natural performer. And her sensitivity to the music is really quite a breath of fresh air in the senior ladies' field this season. Especially given that, you know, quite a few juniors, big name juniors, are moving up from the junior ranks into the senior ranks this season and kind of taking it by storm and she needed something 
that would really make her stand out because she's not doing quads. And I think her really selling point is the fact that she's such such an exquisite artist. She's, you know, super polished. She has fantastic skating skills. And now that she has the triple axel, I think she's really going to be a contender for the Russian world team. And honestly, I was so worried going into the season about Aliona not, like, having that kind of edge to get on like Euros and Worlds teams but I'm really glad to see her scoring so far and how she's performing because it's just, it's it's really comforting but also I'm just like I don't completely understand the decision to add the triple axel into the short at this point in time especially with the how the conditions were at IDF like in regards to the ice but also like I could completely get like the whole thing about like oh you know if you add the triple axel in and you do it cleanly you get get that kind of cushion for you know so you can afford to maybe make a couple of errors in the free but also like there's something to be said about how like Aliona's scoring potential when she's just you know when she's doing a clean program with just a double axle like she can we've seen it like at Finlandia she can easily challenge for those like 80 like around the 80 margin and yeah I just don't see the point at this point in time of adding the triple axle in into the short you know just for consistency's sake she just i mean she has the second highest total score of the season without a quad which i think is really just speaks to like how well she does the rest of her elements and i think she had she got 236 exactly at idf and the highest score is 241 by sasha trusova at skate canada and aliona made some small mistakes in both of her programs you know and her components still have a lot of room to rise so this is by no means her ceiling and I think if she can, you know, maintain the streak of consistency by the end of the season, she should easily be scoring 35 and 75 in program components easily, like out of the gate, like that's what she should be getting. And, you know, I am going to slightly disagree with Evie and say that I think her triple axle looks pretty solid right now. Like we haven't really seen her make a major mistake on it. I mean, granted, it's only been two events, but, you know, she does have the advantage like the other ladies with triple axles. Um, they can build pretty solid like seven eight point leads out of the the short program and that's definitely a cushion that they're probably going to need going into the free skate especially if you're up against someone who's going for four quads that's true (laughs) and well but she's able to score close to 160 and that was with you know some some calls and not quite getting the component scores that she probably should be getting so I'm, I'm just really, really excited for her and excited to see, you know, how far she can go. And we can't, like, stress the fact that it's really impressive that she managed to, you know, win her first Grand Prix up against the current Olympic champion. Yeah. Like, you know, obviously Alina didn't have the best showing here, but I don't, I was completely shocked about what happened, I guess. <laughs> well, I think even if Alina was clean, I don't think she would have won. Like, Aliona won by, what, 20 points? I mean, to be fair, Aliona didn't get any calls in the free, which was kind of a point of contention. Uh, amongst a lot of people so especially in regards to the her lots because it did get uh unclear in the short and then in the free well they called the flip so they called one of them <laughs> <laughs> it's like they called a jump they just called the wrong one ah uh, we're going by japan open rules i see <laughs> speaking of flip calls let's go uh let's talk about kaori who you know had an incredible kind of fight after the short program she I cannot remember the last time Kari made a major error on her loop, honestly. That's what, like, that is her staple jump that I'm always expecting her to do well on. And it's just like, you could really tell the ice was not up to quality because she had a mistake on it in the short and it broke my heart. Yeah. Well, I want to talk briefly about her components because she should not be fourth anywhere in the world. But especially not, you know, with the field at IDF. And she was fourth in all categories, but skating skills in the free skate. I think at worst, I'd probably put her at second in this field. I'd probably honestly give her the edge over Aliona if it came down to both of them skating clean. Because her ice coverage, her speed, her skating skills, you know, interpretation, world class. I feel like with the thing against Aliona is, I think... Kari is just a bit more polished, but that comes with maturity. I feel like at every competition Kari is at at this point, it's just like we all become the Kari Sakamoto PCS Defense Brigade because it's really just like we're so expectant on the fact that she's not going to get the PCS she deserves, especially in like skating skills and stuff. I mean, this is probably the first time I'm ever going to say this, but I'm kind of on the judges' side in regards to like the free skate with the performance interpretation mark just because I don't think that like it's a more, more modern style program and especially the first half of the music doesn't really lend itself to like easy expression 
for her. Like, obviously, the se- second half when it picks up and, you know, she's slicing the judges with a spiral and stuff, <laughs> you know, and it gets really intense, you know, she can d- kind of let go a little bit. But the first half is just kind of like there's not that much there to work with in terms of the music. So, you know, I guess I can kind of understand that, Mark. But, yeah, for the others, I'm just like, no, <laughs> she should be much higher in skating skills and transitions. Evie's going to be excommunicated. Evie's deleted from the PCS of Vince Brigade. Please do not do- <laughs> All right, well, speaking of a lady who did get the PCS she deserved, Satoko, at Cup of China, won PCS in both segments. In the free skate, she was the only lady to score above 70. And, you know, if you ask me, I think giving her under 37 or 75 is still a crime. Agreed. Because she should get that simply for breathing. But, you know, relatively speaking, it was a good call. She won PCS by about five points in the free skate. Personally, I would give her more of a margin than that. But at least, you know. Yeah, at least she won. In the rankings, yeah. This is her first Grand Prix. Um, She's kind of getting a little bit of a late start because of the seating being weird last season. And this is the first time we've seen her since the U.S. Classic. I really wish she didn't have those hand gestures in her short program. I think it's very just, it makes me slightly uncomfortable as a viewer to be watching that. I think, like, the disco part of the music is fine. I think, you know, it's it's fun. Like, it's not egregious during that part. I just don't know who, like, sat down and decided to give her two controversial programs. The short program is more, like, a question mark to me because this music doesn't play to her strengths as a performer. And, I mean, she can she can skate to anything, like, and she can make it good, but of all the music, I think she could really sell and, like, get, you know, tug at your heartstrings with. I don't think Egyptian music was the way to go, so I'm not really sure why this was chosen for her specifically. Yeah, like, like kudos to her for trying something a little bit different, but I don't think it was really, a, a like, a good call. I don't think that her skating lends itself extremely well to more modern pieces of music, so, yeah, I don't know how to feel about it. I mean, her free skate, her Schindler's List, is really exquisitely choreographed as far as, like, just the pure, like, movements that she's doing though I'm still a little bit iffy on her using this music personally um but I think if I had to choose two skaters who could skate to it with the pathos that it requires they would probably be Jason and Satoko just because I think they have like the sensitivity and you know they can do it tastefully you know now that she's changed her costume yeah especially I think that the on the like the tasteful side of things I think it's definitely like obviously not just for the costume side of things but also her interpretation of the like music and the themes of the program has gotten a little bit more nuanced than we saw at like US Classic like the facial expressions aren't as like overt and out there as they were when when we saw it in September it's a little bit softer which I think lends itself a a lot better to the themes of the program not to over express what you're trying to show i just really wish that they she used bells of moscow for the entire cut of the music the program would be a million times better in my opinion it's still beautiful but yeah i overall it's just i'm a little bit uncomfortable watching it i guess yeah i mean i think something to be said for this program is i really like that she didn't just use the main theme from schindler's list that everyone knows and everyone is familiar with yeah Okay, so briefly, let's kind of take a quick look at the final for ladies. So at the moment, the only lady that's like 100% qualified is Anna Sherbakova, who has her two gold medals. Uh, there are still, obviously, lots of others who can qualify. Coming up next week at Ross Telecom, we have Sasha Trusova and Satoko Miyahara again. And we also have Mariah Bell. And yeah, I, I think at this point, it's, almost, it's pretty much a given that Sasha is probably going to win. <laughs> There aren't really any other ladies who can challenge her technically here. Or anywhere else in the world, let's be real at this point. Yeah. Like, I can't see her, unless she makes significant mistakes, walking away from this event with anything but goals. Satoko is potentially on the podium, depending on what the tech panel is like. Um, She needs a silver medal to guarantee that she's going to make it to Grand Prix Final. Um, Mariah needs at least a silver to be on the bubble, but she's going to need to win if she wants to guarantee making it to Grand Prix Final. And then a potential spoiler is Yevgenia Medvedeva, who is probably not going to make the final at this point, but she could block either Satoko or Mariah from getting the points they need if she 
you know, wins a medal. And then in NHK, we have Aliona Kosternaya, Alina Zitova, and Rika Kihira. Aliona needs to get on the podium to make it to the final, and then both Alina and Rika need a silver or better. Basically, NHK is going to be really stressful because it's possible that one of them won't make Grand Prix final, depending on Ross Telecom shakes out, but it also depends a bit on what Mariah and Satoko do. And then Lisa um, and Brady are on the bubble for qualification. And Brady, if that's the case, Brady would win the tiebreaker because she has a silver medal at Skate America. Oh boy, why are ladies like this? <laughs> My heart can't take this kind of abuse. You thought men was chaotic. Like, consider ladies. Consider ladies. <laughs> So our shout out to the week is to Han Yan for coming back to us and saving figure skating with his godly edges and triple axel and for giving the sport another chance. Like we know China is trying to build up their singles and their disciplines before the Olympics but he does seem genuinely really happy to be competing and I just want everyone to give him the support he deserves, please. Like whenever he like lands his triple axel, it's just like the body of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. And honestly, I've got another couple of like shout outs for Cup of China because for one thing, and they're both related to the victory ceremonies. The first one obviously being for pairs, the fact that Shui Shen was the one handing out the pairs medals. And she literally did not do any of the others. She was only there to give the gold to Sui and Han, really. And I was like, this is <laughs> yes. Yes, I love that. And then the second one is ob- is the return of the Cup of China victory ceremony song, the stand up for the champions, for the champions, stand up. Oh my up. gosh. I forgot how much I liked that song. And I was just like, at the start, I was like, okay, I'm kind of already over this. And then by the end of it, I was just like, yes, I'm singing along. This is a bop. When I, so I wasn't watching the victory ceremony live. And so when I saw people saying, so the first line of the Chinese national anthem is like, stand up, stand up. And I thought it was just the anthem. And I was like, why is everyone getting this excited about the Chinese national anthem? Like, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> like, it's a good anthem. but <laughs> And then I'm like, oh, okay. That's like, okay, that's like their victory song. Stand up for the champions. You know what? And whilst we're here, a fourth shout out to the ISU for uploading things to their YouTube channel. Honestly, it's a, it's a godsend. We've got a lot of interviews uh, on the back catalogue for a bunch of people who have competed on the Grand Prix, including skaters like Kevin Amos, and also we have one from Wang Liu. So go to the website uh, in the lowpodcast.com. You can see all of the interviews there, and you can read them or listen to them. And yes, keep your eye out for some more. Woohoo! And so thank you guys for listening. We hope to see you again for our next episode. Woohoo! Right. And we'd like to thank the research team for this episode and our transcribing quality control team. And of course, Evie for editing and Gaff for the gorgeous graphics. And if you want to get in touch with us, then please feel free to contact us via our website in the lowpodcast.com or on Twitter or Instagram. You can also find our episodes on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. If you enjoy the show and you want to help support the team, then please consider making a donation to us on our coffee page we'd like to give a really big shout out to all of the listeners who have contributed to our team thus far especially uh lucy who donated specifically so that i would sing the cup of china victory ceremony song i hope you were happy (laughs) i did the thing i sang for my supper and you can find the links to all of our social media pages and our coffee on the website and if you're listening on itunes then please consider leaving a rating and a review if you enjoyed the show thank you for listening this has been me kite and evie see you soon guys bye bye, bye. bye.